So one of the really great things about R is the availability of different functions and packages that you can use. And we'll talk about what each one of those things, things means in this video. Um, in R, a function, I, this, this is how I think of it. It doesn't necessarily always have these same three steps, but I think of a function as being something that takes some inputs, performs some kind of internal tasks, and ultimately returns some output. Um, sometimes maybe it, it's, uh, we've actually seen some functions already that don't necessarily take inputs, um, but usually, uh, usually this is what a function is doing. So we've actually already seen an example of, of a function. Uh, in the last video, we used matrix to create a matrix, right? So what did that do? Well, we told it some information about the vector of data we wanted to use, the size of the matrix, and information about how to arrange the matrix, whether by row or by column. Then it arranged the data in the way that we specified by our inputs. And then finally, it returned a matrix object to us. So that's what I mean by uh, those three steps of taking some input, uh, performing some internal tasks, and then finally returning some output. Um, if you encounter a function and you don't and you want to get more information about it, you can use in the, in the um, kind of command line within our studio or within R with or whatever other R software you're using, but we'll talk about R studio within R studio. You just type question mark and the name of the function and it will pop up the help file for that function. So if you wanted to learn more about matrix, you could type in question mark matrix and it would pull up the help file associated with the, help, with, the, with the matrix function. One issue that I have with R is sometimes for new users, it can be difficult to really understand what those help files are saying. When you really understand all the terminology of R, there can be a lot of great stuff in those help files, but when you're trying to learn and you don't understand what kind of some of the technical language of R, it can be difficult. So. Another great way, if you run into a function that you don't know what it is, another great way to figure it out is just Google. You could just Google R matrix. And there are gonna to be tons of resources out there on the internet for you talking about how to use matrices in R. As a beginner, that might actually be the better way to go than to just immediately pull up the, the kind of internal help file for the function. Um, okay, many functions have some default inputs, um, so you don't necessarily have to specify all of them. Sometimes you might type in question mark and then the function name, and you'll see that there's like 50 different things that you can specify for some functions. It's just, they're really highly flexible. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to put in all 50 things. A lot of times, some inputs already have some defaults specified, and you're gonna see that when you look at those help files or when you just Google things. So. Let's go ahead and type in question mark matrix, and we can see more information about the matrix function, including any of the default inputs. And it turns out for matrix, we actually have five different inputs we could give the function, and they all already have default specified. So data is already specified as NA, which We'll talk about that later on in a later video, but NA is just like a missing data uh, kind of tag for, for R. Number of rows is one, number of columns is one, by row is false, meaning it's gonna do by column. And then dim names, this is gonna be something that names your, your, your uh, that names your, that, that can name the rows and columns, I think, if I'm remembering right, that's set to null. Um, so without even inputting anything into matrix, it actually already is fully specified by the default inputs. It's not going to give us anything useful, right? If we just call matrix in matrix parentheses, we're implicitly saying use all your default functions. And then it's just going to create a one by one matrix of NAs. What we're doing when we tell it use data of one through 10, use N row of two. We're kind of overriding those defaults with our own inputs. And that's why we could create something other than this default matrix earlier on. But um, I think it's worth, worth realizing um, you don't, 
that a lot of times you'll run into these functions that have a lot of flexibility and you might not even understand what all that flexibility is doing, all the different inputs, and that's fine. Typically, defaults are fine. Uh, it's probably worth digging a little bit to make sure your functions are doing the things that you think they are, but um, you don't necessarily have to kind of make a conscious decision about every single input for a function. Um, Inputs can also be highly flexible. Uh, for example, if you pulled up the help file for C, that function that creates vectors, what you'll see is that the input is just dot, dot, dot. Um, and what that means is that you can kind of give it any number of arguments that you want. So you could use C, you could put in one, you could put in two, you could put in a billion numbers and create a vector of that length, as long as you have the memory to actually create that, that sized vector. Um, so you might see that dot 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 in some of your functions when you pull them pull up help files and that's what that means is it's like extra flexibility that goes beyond whatever flexibility is already built into the function um one of the great things about r not just that functions are available is that it's actually really easy to create your own function why would you want to do this well maybe you're performing the same task more than once um, with just a slight tweak. And so then you can create a function that instead of having to copy and paste your code every single time you wanna do, do the, the, the task, you create one function that does the core of that task with maybe a variable input for the thing that you wanna be different. And then instead of having to copy and paste that code every time, you can just call the function in one line and do that thing every single time. Um, another case is if you want to parallelize your code. Essentially, if you want to parallelize your code, it's going to be way easier to just, uh, as you're doing that, to just call a single function as opposed to calling a big block of code. And so then, um, you know, you can say, uh, split my data, I'm going to have to do some complex thing to my data frame, split it up into 10 smaller chunks, send them each out to their own little worker uh, to parallelize it and then do this one function on each one of those, each one of those chunks of, of data. Um, and, and so in that case, it's gonna be really nice to just have a single function instead of a big block of code that you have to pass to your, your, through your parallelization process. Um, also, I think just making your code more readable, right? If you define a function once and then you know what that function is doing, every time you see it, you know, oh, I'm doing that task again on maybe a different data set or a different variable or something. You don't have to kind of parse through the individual lines of code every time and then go, oh yeah, we're doing that thing again. Oh yeah, we're doing that thing again. Every time you see that chunk, you can, you can just see the name. Hopefully you're, you're giving your functions names that make sense and then you can say, oh yeah, we're just doing, you know, create new variable or whatever uh, once again. So how do you create your own functions? It's, there's actually uh, this, this syntax, it's just function, followed by parentheses, followed by curly brackets. And so what you're doing then is you're creating a new object that you can give it any name you want. Within the parentheses, you're gonna specify what inputs your function needs. And then within the curly brackets, you're gonna specify what, what your function is actually doing. That's where you're gonna write the code of all the internal tasks that your function is doing. And then you're gonna use return to specify what the output is gonna be. So let's actually look at an example of this, right? Let's make a function that calculates the mean sum of squares of three numbers. It takes in three numbers and it creates, it, it, it calculates the mean sum of squares and then returns the answer. So let's look at the syntax here. We're gonna create this new uh, object, a function object called mean sum squares, right? We're going to use, I guess I did, I, I think I forgot to talk about this early on. Um, this is kind of a weird syntax that you probably haven't seen before. This is how you specify, uh, kind of define an object. It's called like the assign operator. And you're saying whatever's on the right, we're going to assign that to what's on the left. So we're assigning this function and everything associated with it to the mean sum squares function object. We're gonna call function and it's gonna take three, so, so our function is gonna take three inputs, num1, num2, and num3, right? We want the mean sum of squares of three numbers, so we're gonna give this function three inputs. And then we're gonna start with open curly brackets 
Um, just for organizational purposes, this is how most people write their function, where they start the curly brackets here, then they have some space where they do the do what the function is going to do, and then put the the close curly brackets down here on the, the after the final line of code. So, um, how do we calculate the mean sum of squares? Well, we square each number. So we're taking num1 squared. We're going to add that to num2 squared. Add that to num3 squared. And then just divide all of that by 3 to get the mean, right? So we're squaring each number. We're summing them. And then we're dividing by 3 to get the mean. So within the function, we're going to create this new object called MSS, mean sum of squares. It's only going to exist inside the function. There's not going to be some MSS that exists outside the function. This is just going to exist inside the function. It's going to take our inputs, do the math that we want to do. And then we're going to tell the function the thing we want you to return back out is MSS, that kind of the answer to MSS. So it's that simple. We give it the inputs here. We do the math here. We tell it what to return here. And then we close out with that final curly bracket. So let's try it out. Let's calculate the mean sum of squares of one, two, and three. So as long as we've, we've, we've put this, you know, we've actually called this, uh, this, this code into, into memory, then we can go ahead and call our function, mean sum squares, give it the inputs of one, two, and three. And kind of under the hood, it's going to do this math for us and return the answer. So we're going to call mean sum squares one, two, three, and get four and two thirds back out. That's exactly what we want. Um, you might find that there are cases where, like here, suppose you thought almost always the third number is going to be a three. The first two are going to change pretty often, but we always want the third one to be the three, a three. Or all, most of the time, we want the third one to be the three. You can even specify your own default argument that way by just saying num3 equals three when you create your function. So up here, if we'd said num3 equals three, and then we didn't put anything in for three here, uh, when we actually call the function, it just knows, oh, default is three. So we're going to use three. There are ways also, I mentioned that some functions can have a flexible number of inputs. You can do that in your own functions too. Uh, it just gets a little more complicated and context specific. I think you did that in the swirl tutorial a little bit if you've already done that. So hopefully you have some experience doing that already. That can be really useful. Um, but it just gets a little more complicated because how it works depends a little bit on exactly what kinds of inputs you're expecting there. All right, kind of a nice, uh, a complement or, or kind of a concept that goes along with functions in R is the concept of a package. A package is a bundle of code, documentation, data, maybe not, all, not necessarily all of these things, but at least some of these things that has been created and distributed by another R user. At the time that I'm recording this, there are more than 16,000 packages available on uh, CRAN, the official repository of R packages. So what's so great about a package? Uh, it's gonna greatly increase the functionality available to you through kind of new canned routines. Um, people have already figured out what the code is to create some new, some new estimator or some new data analysis method. And you can just download their package and call their function instead of having to do that yourself. Uh, also, packages are open source, which means they can be created by anyone, even you. So if in your own research, you discover you've created something that you think would be valuable to the greater community, you can create your own package and put it out there. Um, I've, I've been a part of doing this not for R, but for a Stata package. Um, I've had friends who've created R packages. It's definitely something you can do. It's very easy to do if you think you have some um, some... Uh, code that's that, that's worth sharing broadly. Uh, another thing that's great about being open source is that means you can see the source code of other people's packages. So you don't just have to take it on faith that the package is doing what it says it's doing. You can actually look under the hood and see the code. Uh, that also means you can take other people's packages and kind of tweak them a little bit if they're close to what you want them to do, but not exactly. 
Also, uh, some packages have, <coughs> excuse me, some packages include these things called vignettes, which are kind of like really nice detailed examples of how to use that package's functionality. And that can be really helpful for these kind of more complicated functions or estimators or things like that to see the creator kind of work through an example, maybe some of the underlying math, some of the underlying code to show you what that package is doing. So that's everything that's great about packages. Are there any downsides to packages? Well, I said a package could be created by anyone. That's a positive, but it could also be a negative because you don't necessarily know that that person uh, you know, has maybe used the rigor that you would like in creating a package. So just caveat, utilitor, user beware, packages are great, but I, and you know, you'll find some packages out there that are used by just like millions of people and those are great. Some obscure package that someone's just put out there and no one's really used, you might wanna look a little more closely at it to make sure it's doing what you really wanna do. So how do we use packages? Well, first you have to install them or download them. So there's this install.packages function that you can use, and then you just pass it a character vector of all the packages that you wanna download. And then when you wanna actually load the package into your R session, you use this library function. So if you were to run this code that I have on this page here, you're gonna install the tidyverse package, the mlogit package, and the gmm package in this first line, and then down here, you're gonna go ahead and load all of those packages into your actual R session. It's also worth making sure that your packages stay up to date. You can use the update packages function to do that. There's also a way to just do that through the through RStudio's graphical user interface. So it's probably worth Googling exactly how to do that in RStudio. Um, some recommended packages. I already mentioned these three, Tidyverse, MLogit, GMM. We're going to use those in this course. Tidyverse kind of helps with a lot of data analysis and visualization stuff. MLogit is gonna be what we use to estimate some multinomial logit models. GMM we're gonna use for a generalized method of moments as we get into that material later on. Some other functions that I've used quite a bit in my own research. Uh, glue is a really kind of convenient way to do some, some work with character functions. Uh, Lubridate does uh, a lot of date and time functions if you end up with a data set that has dates and times in it that you need to manipulate. LFE is like a linear fixed effects model package that can do kind of high dimensional fixed effects in a really nice way if you're doing more kind of reduced form work. And then FUR is a great package for doing some parallelization that works along with some of the tidyverse functionality. So just some things to check out if you're curious of some other good packages out there that you might find useful in your own research. All right, that's it on functions and packages. Next up, we're gonna talk about uh, math and statistics in R.